Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Is uh, is good. Is good to see you all. Um, I, I know we are, all of us are at least three years older now, and 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 a tad wiser. I guess a little bit wiser, but um, it, it is a good thing that we are all meeting in person. A beautiful facility. Uh, I want to thank obviously um, the CMAP and and the SAP for a great job. They do day in, day out, uh, setting up this meeting. Uh, with that, um, I would like to call this meeting to order uh, of the MPO Policy Committee and remind, remind you that the meeting is being live streamed. Uh, I would like the Executive Director, Erin, uh, I would like her to please call the roll. Thank you and welcome. And just a couple notes here. Uh, because we have a, a virtual participation, if you are speaking, I'd ask that you turn the microphone on in front of you when the microphone is on when it's green, off when it's red. Um, if you need restrooms, they are straight out in the lobby. There's a men's and a women's room on your left hand side there. We do have coffee and water, but um, with that, I those announcements, I'll call the roll here. Um, if the, I will call the organization by, uh, I will call roll by organization followed by the member's name, but if the appointed member is not in attendance, if you could please identify yourself and then we'll get into it. Uh, IDOT Secretary Osman. Here. Uh, CDOT Commissioner Biagi. Here. CMAP Frank Beal. Here. CMAP President Brawley. Here. CMAP or CTA President Carter. Uh, this is Mike Connolly. I'm the Chief Planning Officer at CTA representing uh, Dorval Carter Jr. Thank you. Uh, Cook County Vice Chair of this committee, Sis Killen. Good morning. Here. Council of Mayors, Mayor Jeff Schilke. Here. DuPage County Chair Deb Conroy. Thank you. Here. Thank you. And just for the folks online, John Loper for Deb Conroy, if you wouldn't mind remembering to use the microphones, folks. Um, FHWA, David Snyder. Uh, John Donovan here for David Snyder. Thank you. Uh, FTA, Kelly Brookins. Thank you. Uh, uh, Illinois State Toll Highway Authority, Director Cassandra Rouse. Here, thank you. Uh, Kane County Chair, Corinne Pirog. I'm Rickert, representing the County Board Chair. Thank you. Kendall County, Scott Gengler. Lake County, Sandy Chair Sandy Hart. Shane Schneider on behalf of Chair Hart. Thank you. Uh, McHenry County Chair, Mike Bueller. Scott Hennings, representing Chair Bueller. Thank you. Metra, Jim Derwinski. Here, present. Uh, Pace Chair Richard Kwasniewski. Here. RTA Leanne Redden. Hi, Jill Leary on behalf of Leanne. Thank you. Um, Will County Executive Jennifer Bertino Tarrant. Here. And Class One Railroads Lindsay Douglas. All right, we do have a quorum, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. Um, would like to move to agenda item two and that uh, refers to agenda changes and announcement. And as far as I know, there are no changes or amendment to the agenda the way we have it. And with that, I would like to take a moment of privilege because we are in person to give some quick updates of, uh, at the Illinois Department of Transportation. If you don't mind, could we move the approval of the minutes first? Oh, did I miss something? Nope, go right ahead. Go right ahead. We'll approve okay. the minutes next. You want to do the minutes? I could do them. No, okay. I'm sorry. Perfect. All right. Um, so, a quick update uh, the Illinois Department of Transportation. Uh, we have just appointed two new uh, Deputy Secretary, Jeremy Lamarche. A lot of you know, know Jeremy. He is a Deputy Secretary um, in, in charge of legislative affairs. And Terry Glavin, um, a new deputy secretary who came to us from CMS, and he's in charge of uh, finance and administration, office of chief counsel, and office of business and work diversity. Um, I could tell you uh, we have been working diligently and very hard between us from within the department uh, to put projects out. Uh, we we do have a pretty good um, what I would call checking account. And it looks pretty good. And that's a reflection of what, uh, of 2019 RBI uh, gave us the finance and the, and the, uh, and the 
actual money we needed uh, to do what we need to do for, uh, for our infrastructure. This June letting, uh, which is a week uh, from tomorrow, is gonna be the largest June letting in the history of the department, in the history of the department. Quite, uh, quite the, uh, the number of projects, uh, some of them are transformational projects for the entire region, for the entire uh, department. We're talking about a letting that is approaching a billion dollars. We never had that uh, in the department. Uh, that is going to be followed by an August letting. Uh, August letting is typically the smallest letting we have. It's one of, out of seven lettings we do at the department. Uh, and it typically ranges around 100, 120 million if we are lucky. Now we... Most likely, most likely looking at uh, 350 to a $400 million letter. So uh, we are in a good place uh, to uh, most, uh, you know, uh, to take care of the, our existing, existing infrastructure uh, as we have it today. Um, Multi-year program typically comes out uh, this time of the year. Uh, we are looking at uh, perhaps uh, late, June this month yet, and uh, is probably going to be uh, the largest. Uh, this and it's, it's still going to reflect. It's going to be a combined highway and multimodal uh, for the first time in decade. We started doing doing that, and it's not just highway uh, program we are putting out, and it's going to be reflective of um, of once again RBI and IIJ, uh, the infrastructure uh, federal infrastructure bill. Um, we went through debt, uh, debt ceiling and uh, legislation that just came out of, uh, of D.C. with a potential rescission, and we worked pretty hard. Uh, that was going to hit the department um, to a tone of $130 million or so, but um, through Holly Bienemann Shop, who's here with us, and with the help, with the enormous help of CMAP and uh, staff and, and the help of FHWA, we have managed to redirect and, and, and ensure that we don't lose, lose that money. So we kept it here uh, in Illinois. Um, of course, uh, we are at the department uh, very much looking forward uh, to meeting in person and continuing the discussion of each and every regional issue uh, for the department, for the state that is. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like to move uh, to approval uh, of the minute. Um, I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes from the March 9th, 2023 meeting. I'll move. Second. Thank you. Thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Thank you. Motion carries. Great. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Secretary, for joining us and for those updates about the department here this morning. Uh, it is really great to see you all in person as opposed to little boxes on a screen. I know we saw each other towards the end of last year, but again, I think um, with the expiration of the Open Meetings Act, uh, making sure that you're reserving enough travel time on your calendar to be here, or that if you are representing someone or need to send an alternate, that you're just communicating that with staff so we can make sure that we have a sufficient quorum to conduct business here. I know that the transportation issues we talk about here and conformity are really important to keep moving. So we're laser focused on making sure we have um, are compliant with the Open Meetings Act and do have a quorum moving forward. Uh, the legislative session wrapped up. I know many of you are aware and had folks in Springfield monitoring the flurry of bills that came out. Um, one of the items that got our attention uh, this last legislative session was House Bill 2878, which amended um, was amended by the Senate, which included a provision that would diminish the role of MPOs and public-private partnerships for transportation projects. Again, it would have put the bill in conflict with federal law. Uh, we brought this to the attention of the bill speaker, Representative Hoffman from Belleville. He did agree with our position as committed to um, working with us on a, a trailer bill and, and did so publicly as he testified before the House Executive Committee that he would address our concerns and reinstate our role in the process this fall in the veto session here. Staff will provide a little bit more context on that moving forward because we do have a legislative update on the bill here. 
Uh, a few other updates for you um, on our safe travel for all roadmap, our STAR program. Um, we have finally secured a, a, an agreement. I signed the grant agreement this week, so we are ready to hit the ground running. We have a board meeting next week that will authorize approval of consultant assistance for this as well. Um, but you can expect updates on future MPO agendas. I know we are working closely with all of our counties to make sure that they have compliant uh, safety action plans for the region, which therefore would unlock federal funds for heart infrastructure dollars. So this multi-year effort really is focused on improving traffic safety in Northeastern Illinois, making sure that we are doing so in a comprehensive, uh, equitable, uh, data-informed and collaborative way here across the region. Again, um, this is all informed by the work that we've been doing, the work that you all asked us to do on safety and transportation safety across our region. Um, so really looking forward to getting that work started in earnest here. I also wanted to share an update with you all on an application we recently submitted for I-290 and the Blue Line CTA corridor. I want to really express my thanks to both CTA, to IDOT, um, and then to our partners who provided letters of support, City of Chicago, CDOT, um, uh, Cook County as well. Um, the project would propose that we set up a project management office similar to the CREATE program structure in looking at the complexities of the 290 corridor and having two major implementers along the corridor, along with numerous municipalities um, and economic opportunities there in the corridor. Um, we think that it's important to make sure that we have a coordinated regional approach. So um, we submitted that grant last week for about three and a half million dollars to hopefully pilot an approach that would take that CREATE program structure and apply it to this corridor in a meaningful way. Um, we'll keep you posted on the progress, um, but we're, we're hoping for the best on that one. Um, planning for climate action, I wanted to also just make note that we are supporting the Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus um, for their application to the Carbon Pollution Reduction Grant Program. Again, this includes a priority climate action plan by March of 2024, which will guide EPA's $4.6 billion um, in implementation grants. And that would make us as a regional agency and your agencies and your municipalities and the counties eligible again to get implementation funding. Our long range plan on to 2050 sets some pretty specific targets uh, related to greenhouse gas emissions across this region here. Um, but over the past decade, we have our, our emissions have only declined by 9%. Sounds like a good thing, right? That we're going in the right direction, but not nearly fast enough. In order to meet the net goal, goal of net zero emissions by 2050, we would have to uh, reduce those emissions by I think 5% per year until we get out to, to 2030. So um, we're a little bit behind the eight ball here, but this Climate Action Planning Fund resource will help us start to tackle these challenges through a data-informed way and then unlock opportunities for all of our implementing agencies then to compete for hard infrastructure dollars that would help us achieve these goals as well. And then a quick note related to CMAP's involvement with Chicago Mayor Brandon Johnson's transition. Um, I was serving on the transition committee and uh, participated in their convenings that they had over the past few weeks. Um, I know that we are bringing our informed regional transportation uh, policies to that table and helping support them as they stand up their policy platform. Um, but just wanted to publicly thank our staff who's also been staffing beyond, behind the scenes as well. They've spent a lot of time um, and, and really making sure that we're bringing things that, that we care about as a regional agency to that table as well. And then we will spend the majority of today's agenda talking about the plan of action for regional transit. I know I've had one-on-one -on -one conversations with many of you and my staff have been working with many of you to really talk about where we are in the process and where we think we're headed over the next couple months here. Again, we've been convening the steering committee, working groups, research, analysis, um, but really at the end of the day, uh, it's this body and our board that will need to approve these recommendations to the General Assembly. Um, so I encourage you to get engaged in the conversation today. I think it's really important for us to hear from you um, together, collectively hear from each other about where we're at in this process. Um, it will help continue to inform our, our, um, our recommendations as we develop that report here. 
So I just wanted to close and uh, by thanking you all again for your continued commitment to regional issues. I know that getting back into in-person meetings means substantially more time, but um, I do appreciate each and every one of you for taking the time to be here and to be part of the regional conversation. It does help us ultimately achieve our goals when we work together. So with that, back over to you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I uh, would like to move on uh, over to item 4.02, uh, which is the CMI board report. Uh, Mr. Brawley. Yes, um, pitching in for Leanne Redden today uh, from the CMAP board. The board met in April and May. Uh, in addition to several procurements and contracts, the board approved uh, procurements and contracts and updated public policy uh, for participation, uh, which I think we're seeing on the agenda today. The board also received an overview of CMAP's annual report, the annual report for the coordinating committee and their objectives for 23, and an update to the 2023 State of the Region, the public opinion of survey, and then the Regional Ex Excellence Awards, which I'm sure you saw. Uh, the legislative updates um, for the state and the federal level. And then lastly, what we're going to talk about today, the plan of action for regional transit, which we're going to talk about. The next board meeting is next week and Flag Day, June 14th. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, moving on to the Council of Mayors report, Mr. Mayor Shelfie. Thank you. The uh, Council of Mayors uh, met on April 18th. Uh, in the meeting included updates from CMAP, the STP Project Selection Committee, IDOT's local roads, and a legislative update. The committee was provided with an overview of CMAP's safe travel to for all roadway map program, which encompasses all CMAP transportation safety network, safety work. It was announced that CMAP has received a $4.87 million planning grant to create a regional safety plan that will include county level safety plan action plans. The committee also briefed the, was briefed on the plan of action for the regional transit part uh, which was discussed will be discussed later on today's agenda. The next meeting of the of the uh, Council of Mayors is scheduled for July eighteenth, twenty twenty three. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, other items for approval. Uh, those are section five or item agenda five. Is the first item uh, is on the twenty twenty three FTA sub area uh, allocation. Um, Mr. Uh, Petroviak, <laughs> Russell. You did well. You just call me yeah, Russell. Yeah, thank you, Russell. <laughs> All right. Um, item 5.01, which is the FFY 2023 FTA sub allocation between Indiana, Illinois, and Wisconsin in Illinois for 5307, 5340, urbanized area, 5337, state of good repair, 5339, bus and bus facilities. Um, at the March 16th, 2023 RTA board meeting, the funding splits were approved by the RTA board. At the April 28, 2023 Transportation Committee, there was a recommendation to approve for approval to the MPO Policy Committee uh, for the same sub area allocations that are included in your memo that was included in your packet. Um, it's straightforward. This is something that we do on a regular basis. There is a letter of understanding between the different agencies on the funding splits. So everybody who is uh, involved in this process has signed off on it. Um, with that, if there are any questions I can ask, I can answer them at this time, but we ask for your approval of the FTA funding splits included in your packet. Thank you. Any questions, comment? Yeah, thank you. Oh, Second. Thank you. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The motion carries. Okay. Uh, Russell, yes, since sir. you are up there, next I'm item. Up there, I got the next one too. All right. Also included in your packet today is the Attitude 2050 TIP Conformity Analysis and TIP Amendment 23-08. The CMAP region, as you know, is a non-attainment area for ozone. Uh, in fact, so far this summer, which has really just begun, preliminary data shows that all of our ozone monitors are in violation of the current ozone standard except for one. Um, what does this mean? It means that the region has some work to do to get into attainment for ozone. 
And you can expect to hear more about what we're thinking about doing and what Illinois EPA is thinking about doing at future meetings. We're not going to go into details about that now. Right now, it's just to give you some information. That being said, CMAP is required to demonstrate that the long range plan and the TIP conform to our motor vehicle emissions budget for our area through a regional emissions analysis of transportation projects that are in the TIP. The regional emissions analysis uses the latest planning assumptions and social economic forecasts that are in the ONTO 2050 plan update. Specifically, projects in the TIP subject to air quality analysis requirements demonstrate, when modeled, that the region does not exceed our motor vehicle emissions budget, which is shown near the end of the memo that was included in your packet. On a side note, I wanted to mention that projects shown on the conformity memo could have waited to go through the next conformity analysis, which is in October. However, one of our key cogs doing this conformity work, some of you may know, is Leroy Koss, and he has announced that he will be retiring. So we wanted to have some of our younger staff work with Leroy, who has a lot of expertise in helping do this process, uh, one more time before he gets to leave and share his, uh, his wisdom with all the rest of us. Um, as stated in the memo, results of the emissions modeling demonstrate that regional emissions are below the region's motor vehicle emissions budget, which is a requirement to demonstrate conformity for ONTO 2050 long range plan and the TIP. At this time, staff requests approval of a finding of conformity uh, for TIP Amendment 23-08 by the MPO Policy Committee. And I will answer any questions if there are any at this time. Yes, thank you. Second. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The motion carries and good luck Leroy with the retirement. Um, moving on to item 5.03, which is the appointment of chair and vice chair for the CMAP Transportation Committee, uh, Mayor Shelke. The appointment of the chair and vice chair of the CMAP Transportation Committee. Due to the resignation of former chair of the Transportation Committee, I am recommending the appointment of Kevin Carrier as chair and Kara Orborn as the vice chair of the Transportation Committee. Kevin has served as vice chair of the committee since 2022 and as the assistant county engineer for Lake County's Department of Transportation and oversees capital programs for Lake County. His experience includes development and oversight of the county's capital improvement projects, preparation of intergovernmental agreements, and administration of the county's paratransit program and coordination of the motor fuel tax funded projects. Kevin has assisted with the 2022 launch of the Ride Lake County, a borderless countywide paratransit service. Kevin has been a member of the Transportation Committee since 2017 and became vice chairman of the committee last year. Kara is the assistant superintendent of the Cook County Department of Transportation and Highways. She has 24 years of transportation industry experience. Kara worked in the private sector on the planning and design of transportation systems for the tollway, state, and many municipalities. During that time, Kara developed a passion for public service, which led her to join the Cook County Department of Transportation and Highways in 2016 as a chief project engineer and of the Project Development Bureau, where she oversees the development of the department's multi-year plan annual budget, intergovernmental agreements, phase one studies, traffic services, and land acquisition. She serves, as, serves on several CMAP committees and has been a member of the Transportation Committee since 2019. With that, I would make a motion to appoint Kevin Carrier as the chair and Tara Orborn as vice chair of the Transportation Committee. So moved. Thank yeah. you. Second. Second. Thank you. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. So the motion carries and both of them are great, uh, great appointment. Item 5.04, which is appointment of subcommittee for nominating the vice chair of the MPO policy. As we all know, each year, the chair of the MPO committee 
appoint a nominating committee to bring forward a name or names for the, for the vice chair of the MPO for the following year. This year, I'm, I am appointing the following members to meet before our next regularly scheduled meeting in the fall. A Frank Bell to represent the regional planning agency, CTAs, uh, Mike Connolly to represent the public transportation agency, uh, Mayor Jeff Schelke to represent municipal government, Commissioner Gia Biagi to represent highways and road transportation, and Tom Rickert to represent counties. This does not require a vote and it's only for information. With that, item 5.05, .05, which is public participation policy. Over to you, Director. Great, thank you so much. Um, item 5.05 .05 asks for your approval of this committee's public participation policy. The Open Meetings Act, as many of you know, requires an in-person quorum for this body. However, to maintain accessibility and transparency and encourage public participation, there's a desire to continue to provide the public with a virtual option um, to give comments at meetings and to listen in. Uh, the proposed policy sets clear and structured guidelines for members of the public who want to provide public comment in writing, in person, or virtually at a meeting of the MPO Policy Committee or at its working or public bodies um, and other public bodies that fall out of the MPO Policy Committee as well. So with that, um, you should have seen the draft policy in your packet. Um, we are looking for your approval at this time. So moved. Yeah. Thank you. All in favor, say aye. Aye. All aye. say nay. The motion carries. Uh, moving on into um, uh, plan of action for regional transit, which is part report update. Sounds good. I'll kick it off as our staff uh, gets ready to present here this morning. As I mentioned earlier, this is the meat of our conversation here today. Um, as a reminder, we have scheduled a special meeting of the MPO on the 13th of September um, to do two joint meetings this year with our board. Um, part of the reason is we want to make sure that we're bringing the recommendations to you all prior to asking for your approval. And so we thought the best way to do so was to schedule a special meeting of this board. Um, and then we would seek approval in the October meeting um, at your regularly scheduled joint uh, CMAP board meeting. Uh, an MPO policy committee meeting. So I want to emphasize just really the benefit the transit has to all of our communities here before we get into the conversation here. I know that every part of our region experiences transit a little bit differently, um, whether you're in Will County or McHenry County or you're in Bedford Park or you're in Logan Square, um, you know, it does provide needed access to communities across our region, to people across our region who need to get to healthcare, to schools, you know, to doctor's appointments to visit family, but it also greatly impacts our roadway system here. Um, and it has impacts on congestion as well. And so when we think about how we want to serve the people of our region with transportation access to places, you know, the stronger that network is, the more multimodal network that we have, the better it is for our economy and for our people here. Um, the cost of an action is something that bears repeating. I know I've said this before, and the size of the fiscal cliff that we face right now is unlike any other. We're not alone. Other major cities are, and regions are dealing with this fiscal cliff, but without action, again, we'll find ourselves in a place that I don't think we want to be here as a region. Our initial scenario reviews have shown that in order to achieve that 20% cut in operations funding, we would have to eliminate 40% of the transit service that exists today, 40%. That's if we were just, you know, take some lines off a map here and do some rough cuts, not saying that anybody's proposing this, it would mean stopping all service on CTA's yellow, purple, green, and brown lines. It could mean stopping all service on Metro's Heritage Corridor, North Central Service, Southwest Service, the Milwaukee District North and West and UP lines. And if that's not enough, eliminating 90 bus routes from CTA and more than 70 PACE bus routes. Again, we're just doing the math to make that add up to 40%. So again, each of our agencies would have to take some draconian cuts like we've never seen before. Um, but 
it would impact over 100 cities across our region who now have vibrant downtown transit-oriented development stations that are really a key component of their communities here. And 20 Chicago neighborhoods and six communities would lose, six suburban communities would lose access to the CTA train service. So again, that's hundreds of thousands of people that would be impacted by these shifts. Again, the consequences would be as drastic with our ADA and paratransit service across the region as well. Um, who And people who are overly reliant on our ADA service just wouldn't have the access to get to the places that they need to go. So again, you know, when you cut service, People don't come back and they see that there isn't service available. So again, it becomes this downward spiral. And that's what we're really trying to get ahead of here with this report is to work with you all to figure out how we stave this off um, and how we make sure that our region remains a place where people want to come, a place where businesses want to locate, and a place where we all call home is economically successful, is vibrant, and is not just riddled with congestion because we don't have options for people to get to the places that they need to go. So with that somber note, I'm going to turn it over to Amy Lee, who's going to talk us through. Um, thank you, Erin. Um, so thank you for providing that. Just a, a level set understanding, because as Erin said, Later this year, we're gonna be confronted with some pretty big decisions as a region. Um, and so I wanna make sure you understand why uh, CMAP is leading and developing this plan of action for regional transit. Um, Amy, would you pull the microphone a little closer to you? Yeah. Thank you very much. RTA, uh, as part of its financial oversight responsibilities has sounded the alarm. Come 2027, transit faces a significant funding shortfall and operating funds due to the impacts of the pandemic. Subsequently, as you can see here up on our screen, subsequently the legislature passed this mandate asking CMAP to develop a bold vision for regional transit in light of our post-pandemic reality. Um, they've also asked us to identify sustainable funding sources to support that vision. And of course, um, that you see there at the end, uh, they've asked us to identify potential changes in governance that might be needed to achieve that bold vision and to support efforts to secure new funding. To that end, we have formed three discussion groups around the topics of the system that we want. What is that vision for what we want transit to do uh, moving forward? Uh, how do we pay for it? What are the funding sources that we see providing transit the sustainable funding that it needs and how to implement it. And that's um, largely re uh, related to the governance issues. So um, we're gonna uh, come up here, give you an overview of some of the things that are coming out of those three discussion groups. I'm gonna ask uh, Daniel Como, my colleague, to, to talk about the system that we want first. Thank you, Amy. So good morning, uh, my name is Daniel Como. I am a senior transportation policy analyst here at CMAP. Uh, so as Amy said, I'm gonna talk about the first cluster, the system we want. Uh, we know that this project is moving at uh, breakneck speed for a long range planning agency, uh, but that we also know that it's hard to talk about how to pay for it or how to implement it without knowing what it is. Uh, so we've tried to have this piece of the project uh, move a little bit ahead of the other two so that we have more uh, you know, defined recommendations that we can talk about as we move into broader discussions around funding and, and system governance. If you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, what we have in, on the slides and also in your, your printout is the sort of current summary level version of the recommendations across a number of different topic areas uh, that are collectively making up this, this packet of, of system that we want recommendations. Uh, so I'll walk through them at a very high level, uh, and then we can have a discussion about you know, your reactions to this as a, as a package, uh, things that you think might be missing. Uh, we're also going to be posting much more detailed versions of all of these uh, on, our, on our website or on the, on the PART project webpage uh, in the coming months, and you know, can have additional discussions about them uh, or with your staff. So the first one of these uh, we're calling Better Buses, uh, and this is really recognizing the important role that the region's bus systems, both CTA and PACE, have played in providing access to opportunities throughout the pandemic. Uh, they had much more resilient uh, ridership than the other aspects of the transit system, because we know the important kinds of trips uh, that, that buses are supporting and the, the riders who are relying on them. 
And so we've identified some recommendations around planning for uh, regional networks of bus priority, thinking about how we make sure that that actually can be implemented, uh, whether that's through changes to design manuals or identification of priority corridors. And then also um, making sure that we have appropriate staff capacity, not only in the transit agencies, but also in the, the roadway agencies, since we know that you know, buses do not run on roads owned by the transit agencies. They actually are run on facilities owned by other, the other many of the other entities that are represented on this body. Um, the other aspect of this that we are uh, you know, recommending as part of this is to move forward with the broader use of automated enforcement for uh, bus priority infrastructure. Uh, and this is something that we know the city of Chicago is piloting in its downtown area, and we think could be a you know an interesting model to pursue more broadly. Uh, but also recognizing that if we were to pursue that, we need to be upfront about thinking about you know redirect or keeping the revenue uh, generated from that to pay for the administration, and also if there's any incremental uh, paying for actual investments in bus priority projects. The next topic is fair policy. And there's two different slides here that I'll, I'll walk through. Um, one of them is thinking about how we can move toward a system of more seamless and integrated fares uh, across regional transit and then actually connecting to other modes. So this is a, a long, uh, long time topic of discussion here in the region. Uh, we've identified some general principles and uh, important elements of achieving this uh, idea of seamless and integrated fares thinking about an ongoing structure for full fare integration, uh, some kind of owner for you know, decision-making, whether a single body or a joint uh, decision-making authority um, with timelines to achieve that integration, thinking about what kinds of goals we would like to have in an integrated structure, something like a unified payment method, consistency across our region's transit fares for your discounted transfers, but also recognizing that if we were to achieve this, it would have costs, it has revenue implications uh, in terms of fares, and it also has capital implications depending on the model that the, the region's transit operators decide to pursue. Uh, we do think it's also important to highlight that transit, as we all know, does not exist in a vacuum and that there are important opportunities for transit to integrate with complementary modes, uh, things like Divi and other bike share programs, uh, as well as how transit interfaces with other mobility systems whether that's the South Shoreline or Amtrak, or thinking about you know, whether there could be data sharing requirements to better understand uh, the interface between transit and private mobility providers like Uber or Lyft. If you go to the next slide, the other aspect of fare policy that we think is important to talk about is the overall levels of fares and how that relates to the affordability of our, our transit system. We know that Transit is far more affordable than owning and operating a personal vehicle. Um, it would be far more affordable even if transit were significantly more expensive than it is today. Um, but if we are looking at what we generate in terms of fare revenue, we also know that increasing fares poses affordability challenges for people that rely on the system. And so what we're talking about is a way of pairing uh, a, you know, a continued commitment to ensuring that fair revenues remain a stable source of operating revenue. Uh, we don't want them to erode with inflation over time. And this is something that historically our region's transit providers have done. They have kept fares on pace with inflation. Uh, and we are recommending that, or the, the steering committee is discussing recommending uh, that we could continue that commitment and ensure that you know, while we don't expect fair revenue to return to its previous share of the operating funding picture, that we do want to at least ensure that it is stable. Um, but if we are to do that and to move forward with increases in transit fares, that we also want to ensure that people can continue to affordably access the system, thinking about strategies like low income fare subsidies. This is something that a recently passed transit omnibus uh, bill will require uh, the RTA to study, and so this is something that we expect some additional analysis and, and action on, uh, as well as thinking about other strategies like fair capping, where you sort of you can buy into a monthly pass or a weekly pass, uh, or unifying our, our region's existing uh, patchwork of fair subsidies for youth or for students into a more uh, integrated regional youth uh, subsidy program. Uh, I know I'm going through a lot here, uh, so appreciate you bearing with us. Um, we also have some ideas on transit system accessibility. I'll talk first about this on the fixed route system, and we'll come back to demand responsive and, and paratransit a little bit later. 
you know, this is an area that we know there's been a lot of attention and important, um, important attention on in the last couple of years as we've had discussions around ADA transition planning. Uh, and we know that our region's transit providers are also making significant progress in upgrading their stations and providing that on-system transit accessibility. But we do see opportunities to you know, build on that work, continue that planning, uh, developing a full regional detailed plan and timeline for ADA accessibility on the system, but also thinking about where there are um, key gaps or breaks, whether that's a sidewalk or a curb cut, um, that mean that there is not accessibility to the transit station, even if the station itself is accessible. Uh, and we're also thinking about what kinds of technology solutions could be deployed uh, to improve the system's ease of use, not just for people who have you know, physical mobility impairments, but also auditory, visual, and other, other challenges. Um, on the next slide, uh, we've also heard from, from you and from many others the importance of discussing the safety and security uh, and cleanliness of the system for the riders who rely on it. Uh, we know that this has been a significant challenge, um, both of perception and, and reality uh, over the, the last few years. And so we identified some potential themes, things about increasing staff presence on the system, uh, ensuring that riders can communicate issues and can also receive information from the operators, uh, and then identifying strategies like physical infrastructure, like lighting or bus shelters, um, or broader access to public restrooms. And this is, all of these things are things that extend beyond the transit system. They are not transit system specific problems, uh, but they are things that show up on the transit system. So thinking about what kinds of supports or investments we might recommend uh, in particular that the state could, could help to, to implement. The next slide is a broader uh, principle. And this is something I wanna, I wanna pause on for a little bit, which is to say that, you know, we've, as, as Erin uh, mentioned in, the, in her opening to this section, you know, we are facing some really dramatic consequences of failure. The, the consequences of not acting would, would be a really um, reduced transit system or a shell of its former self. And as we've had discussions with the steering committee and with, with stakeholders throughout the region, you know, we do think it's important to highlight that our goal is not to do the best with the money that we happen to have if we do nothing. Uh, our goal is to maintain and you know, really improve upon our robust transit system here in the region and to strive for a system that provides good service um, to, to riders who need it um, throughout the region, throughout the day, to all sorts of different trips. You know, we've had conversations with many of you, with uh, our Community Alliance for Regional, Equi Regional Equity Program, with focus groups, with, you know, we've, we've heard from this, the input that the RTA conducted in a strategic plan. And when you ask people what they want, they want more service, they want more types of options, they want more frequency on PACE, on Metro, on CTA. Uh, and so we know that we are facing a fiscal cliff and that even retaining the service that we have will be a challenge. Uh, but that it is also important to talk about the fact that people actually want more uh, and that if we identify strategies that allow us to provide that service, that that will be meeting needs of travelers here in the region today. Um, and we are focusing in this project on the operating implications of that. We know that there are also capital consequence or capital implications. Uh, there are investments that are required to provide more service. Uh, there's state of good repair issues that are, mean that it is more expensive to provide service today, uh, but that you know this is something that we are trying to talk about and to really emphasize that one of our goals of this work is to emerge with a system that is stronger than the one that we had, not just uh, trying to you know get back to where we were. An example of that, if you go to the next slide, is the discussions that you may have already heard about. Um, you know, as Metra discusses its potential evolution into a regional rail model, uh, so providing more all-day service, serving different kinds of trips, uh, not focusing as heavily on the nine-to-five uh, loop-oriented commute, um, that if you were to take this idea about more frequent service and play it out in the example of one of our, our transit operators, that this is the kind of approach that you might land on, a regional rail approach. And so uh, Metra actually came and presented, well, all of the service boards came and presented to the uh, Transportation Committee. Um, recently, and, and we could provide that recording if it would be um, helpful to you, but 
Um, this was something that in Metro's presentation they emphasized is something that they're currently thinking about both in the near term and as they do broader uh, network scale planning. Uh, and so we've identified some principles that we think would be an important element of that, things like ensuring that we have uh, transit supportive land use in proximity to Metro's existing stations, and also identifying whether there could be infill stations that can help to close rail service transit gaps, rail transit service gaps, um, as well as thinking about what is possible in some corridors and not others because of, of freight conflicts. We do know that not all things are possible in all places with the existing freight system. Um, as with all of these investments in additional service and additional frequency, there are costs. Uh, this would require operating investments. It would also require changes in some of the capital assets like rolling stock and some targeted infrastructure investments. Uh, but we think that it's important to start to talk about that as a potential area where the state could provide additional support uh, to facilitate this kind of transformation. The next slide is sort of moving away from the traditional fixed route bus and train uh, system to another important aspect of regional transit, which is our demand responsive services. And so here in the region, you know, we have our, our pace bus routes and our CTA trains and buses and our, our metro trains, but we also have uh, a system of, of ADA paratransit that provides really critical access to people that cannot access the, the fixed route system. And we also have a network of dial-a-ride systems or demand responsive systems uh, that provide options for people in areas where fixed route transit might not be as uh, robustly available. And so we're identifying some recommendations building on previous uh, work done by the RTA and, and PACE on how we could support the integration of those kinds of dial-a-ride services into wider geographies. Uh, McHenry County and Lake County provide really good examples here in our region of this kind of work. Uh, and we think that there could be opportunities to expand on that, uh, as well as thinking about within the ADA paratransit context, whether we might be able to, again, expand on existing models like the taxi access program here in the city of Chicago or the DuPage Uber access program um, in DuPage County, which provide paratransit users with additional same day options that actually save the system uh, money. And I, I, I do want to you know, recognize that Demand responsive services are very expensive to provide by design. It is it is not uh, cheap to do this kind of service, and it won't be. You can't provide every transit trip with a demand responsive trip, uh, but it does make sense in some contexts, in some places, for this to be the option. And especially for people who rely on the paratransit services, it is in many cases the only option. Uh, and so, as we're thinking about you know, strengthening the whole transit system, this is an important element uh, of that to consider. And then last but not least, uh, we have, uh, as required in the, the legislation that started this whole process, uh, we're also thinking about the land use and development implications of um, those kinds of decisions and what they mean for a financially sustainable transit system. Uh, and so we're thinking about this in a few ways. One is whether there are opportunities in the nearer term to leverage public assets or investments things like incentive programs or public assets like um, metro parking lots or other parcels in proximity to transit systems that could be targets for potential state incentives for uh, greater levels of development so that we can use that as an opportunity to build an additional rider base uh, and to build opportunities that drive people uh, to take transit uh, to those, those opportunities. We're also thinking about what kinds of private sector shifts uh, the state could help to support, whether that is things like the uh, recently passed legislation that would require larger employers in the RTA service area to participate in the pre-tax transit benefits program, or more comprehensive approaches like we've seen in other states for employers to set uh, commute trip reduction targets and help to enable uh, greater access to transit to their, uh, their employment sites. In the long term, we do think it's important to acknowledge the, the ways in which transit and land use are inextricably linked, uh, and that the financial viability of transit will require discussions about land use, uh, but that there are opportunities to think about this you know, within CMAPs planning, our comprehensive planning uh, work here at the agency, as well as what kinds of longer term solutions uh, could enable that, that long term long term financial viability. So I know that was a, a wall of text, uh, and it's going to be we're not going to have enough time to talk about every element of any detail, but if anyone has any initial reflections or thoughts, we have a few minutes for that now. 
Uh, and again, if you have additional comments or feedback, we'd be happy to speak with you or your staff um, as a follow-up to this meeting. So the next slide has a couple of just general prompts for discussion, but the, the gist is, you know, do you have any reactions to this? Um, is there anything big that you think we're missing or are things that you would like to highlight that you have concerns about? Thank you. Yeah, um, Chair Kwasniewski. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think, a, you know, a lot of what's in this, um, in some cases, we're all kind of like working on already. And certainly we need to do more and quite frankly, adapt. Um, and I know, Aaron, uh, you've had a conversation with Melinda pretty extensively about some of the details of some of those programs. And, you know, I think we're all kind of like trying to pull together and figure out how to do these unique services. Obviously, you talked a little bit about Metra, and I know CTA is doing some things as well. And we're actually out there looking at, at different opportunities for like third shift options for, uh, for employers. Uh, we're doing a lot more on-demand service. Uh, a lot more coordination with all the counties in regards to ADA paratransit service where people can connect throughout the county. So, you know, I know we're uh, collectively between the transit agencies, I think, you know, we'll be giving you guys all that information so that everyone understands what we're all doing, because a lot of the people, even on your steering committee, I don't believe understand everything that's actually already implemented. It's a matter of how do we implement more? How do we adapt? How do we prioritize? And I think we're all trying to do that. So um, I think you identify a lot of things in here that certainly need to be addressed and we agree. Um, and the funding aspect of it is you're right. I mean, we all wanna do more service. You do the focus groups, everybody says they want more, but nobody wants to pay more. So it's a difficult situation, and especially like with our ridership and majority of them, um, you know, need the service and quite frankly, you know, in some cases can't afford it. And then, you know, we get some of the legislative stuff that happens where we're granting free rides to factions of people that erode the existing fare structure that we've already got. So we've got some challenges that, you know, I think it'll be good. We all hopefully get on the right, the same page moving forward, um, that not some arbitrary decisions are being made and then nobody understands the financial or practicality concepts of what needs to happen. Yeah, thank, thanks for that. And I, th I think one of the goals of our working with the steering committee is also to uh, daylight a lot of the work that you all are doing that you all know is going on and elevate that conversation so that more people know what's going on at the service boards across our region as well. And um, especially as we get to the point of making some recommendations for folks in Springfield, I mean, getting their attention and, and recognizing that an investment in our three transit agencies here is a strong and, and, and competitive investment and something that's worthwhile. So I think we're trying to trying to really show what you all are doing and make sure that that as we make some of these recommendations that they find them worthy of investment because you all are very cost efficient per ride, right? And so I think we wanna just make sure that we're echoing those points that you have. So thank you, thank you. I'd like to make a couple of comments. Is there anything missing? And I guess what I'm thinking may be missing here, or at least we probably should talk about it, is we have different parts of the region that are experiencing phenomenal growth. Uh, out in the northwest corner of Kane County, uh, we have the little town called Hampshire. And there's a new mayor out there. And because I'm the old man in the room, as far as mayors go, uh, he's kind of adopted me as his mentor or something. So he comes in and chats with me. And he's faced with an issue out there that before he got elected mayor, the Hampshire City Council has annexed and zoned uh, 2,800 new home lots into his city that have yet to be built on. And in my town, Batavia, this past year, we have started construction. Many have been completed. Some are under construction of 549 new units of living units. And uh, in my town, I have now have six senior living communities. I have almost 2,000 residents that are all living in, in, in uh, what I'm hearing and seeing is a huge demand from those folks for bus service that, you know, the call and rides and stuff that we've never had before this. And in talking to other mayors in the outlining areas, everybody seems to have this problem going on. So there's a, there's a demographic 
growth thing that's happening here that is not happening in a lot of other places. But I think in the Chicago area, we do have it. So I just think that this thing needs to somehow pay some act activity to what's going to be happening here and where it's going to be five years from now. There's a conversation going around at the northwest corner of Kane County and McHenry County around the Huntley area. Uh, there's a huge number of new lots that are being proposed and built, and they just put in the interchange at 90 and 47, which it seems to be driving it. The mayor Rockford has talked to me a couple times about, you know, he's seeing impacts in his town because of that tollway access that's now been presented. The other thing I would just tell you as the mayor and kind of the outlining area, uh, over the years, I, I was in here one time when, when Don Kopek was in here, and he and I got invited out to Belvedere to have a meeting with all the mayors in Boone and Winnebago County about how they could get the RTA services out into that area. I subsequently have been to the city of DeKalb City Council and heard that same thing. And uh, it, it does, and now we have McHenry or uh, Kendall County that wants to have RTA services, but they can't figure out how they want to pay for them. And that's a unique little wedge in the room that I don't know where that's going because I don't think you're going to get anything to your green to pay the RTA sales tax, which really has proven in my view to be a very worthwhile way of funding things. So there's a lot of moving parts here and there's a lot of questions that I think this committee needs to be asking. Thanks, Mayor. Other, yeah. Jim. I'd just like to uh, echo what uh, Rick Kwasniewski said about the fact that we've kind of been doing this already. And I think the thing that we've identified clearly is that year after year after year, the transit agencies back themselves in a financial corner and we make decisions not to build a system we need, but to adjust the system for what we can afford. So I know we haven't got to the money yet, and that's the big question here. But I and I also agree with Mayor Schelke that the system that exists today and all the things that were put forward is not the system of the future. The system of the future is much bigger and broader. We're seeing this constantly now with this new ridership pattern. It is not, like you said, it's not nine to five anymore. It is maybe on Wednesday, maybe on Saturday. And that system, you can't just make uh, to meet those ridership demands by adjusting schedules or bus routes. You, it's got to be there every day for people to actually access it and use it. And so it's building a system that fully integrates all these systems together is going to really support the region. And I, I too, uh, talk with DeKalb and Rockford and Kendall on a, on a normal basis. And yeah, there's there's much a greater demand for um, even a broader system than exists today. Other, oh yeah, go ahead. So just piggybacking on the comments that have been made today, it's we're making sure that we're looking forward, not just what we have today and filling the hole that we have today and really grappling with the tough conversation that is coming before this committee. How are we gonna pay for what we have today and more? I think making sure that we keep the more at the front of this conversation is gonna be imperative. We have a lot of uh, big asks, you know, that may be coming of the legislature with this finding. And I think making sure that we keep accessibility, affordability, you know, improving service services, the transit agencies are here to serve residents. We're here to serve businesses and we're also to catalyze opportunities opportunities for additional businesses to come into our region. So these decisions go beyond just what we what we have here today. And I do think that we are, you know, getting on the right track. I want to thank CMAP for, for listening to a lot of the comments that have been shared and seeing things get into the presentation that are um, you know, weren't in there before. And I think that's where we where we do need to shift. And it's the partnership of everybody around this table that we're going to need to make this happen. All right, well, I know we have uh, another couple sections because you do want to hear about the money, <laughs> I'm sure, yeah. right? Um, and some governance. So, oh yeah, Mike, yeah. go ahead. Thanks. Um, thanks. The, the only comment I wanted to to bring to this to this group is it, about the frequency issue, which which was highlighted in in the presentation and has been highlighted in the discussions that we've had with you, and 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 some of it has to do with the way that that Metra is is proposing the restructuring. Um, and I, what I wanted to suggest is that you consider public transit as a public utility, because that's what it is. Um, and it should be available, readily available to everyone across the region. You don't go to the faucet and say, oh, 
I got to wait 15 minutes for the next water availability. You go to the faucet and you turn it on and the water comes out. That's the way transit needs to be imagined and needs to be structured in this region. That is the way that we will see the ability to reach the goal that's in our on to 2050 of doubling transit ridership. That's also the way that we will see a huge impact on our air quality. Uh, Chicago is, is one of the very few places other than Miami that has seen an increase in congestion since pre-pandemic. Um, we have a worse traffic problem. We're losing more hours to congestion today than we were pre-pandemic. And Miami is the only one in that top city list that is as bad as that. And part of that is the way Miami's laid out. But but that's a that's a reality for us. And the way to reverse that, the way to change that is to provide fundamentally transit across the region as a utility so that people can depend on it and know that it's coming. Go to the faucet and turn it on and the bus comes or the train comes. Well, thank you all for your comments. As I said, we'll, we'll be sharing additional information. And if you have any uh, other topics you'd like to talk about with us, we'd be happy to have those conversations after this meeting. Thank you all. I think I'm tall enough for this. Okay, yes. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Elizabeth Scott, a principal policy analyst at CMAP and along with Daniel and Amy and frankly, most of our staff, I'm one of the people uh, working on the plan of action for regional transit. The workflow that I have been most focused on is the public finance element of this. What are the options that are realistic and can be um, seriously considered in this region to think about how we not just meet the three quarters of a billion dollar operating gap that is facing us in 2026, but think about how we can sustainably over time invest the extra revenue needed to get us to the system of the future, to get us to the system that we want, the system that our people want, and that, you know, we as a region have a legacy of, of providing at a really impressive and great level. So embracing that and continuing it into the future how are we going to pay for that? Um, so, so we have been hard at work, uh, working with consultants, uh, you know, across our consultant team, but especially with SB Friedman, thinking about, uh, okay, what what are the options? So, if you look at how transit is funded today, a really big piece of it is the sales tax, that has been the case for many years, and uh, we believe that whatever package of solutions comes forward is probably going to have a sales tax element to it. Um, thinking about the way the tax is structured now and what it does in the state, there are a few different things that, you know, potentially could make sense. And as we go on, I'm going to expand on these. But at a simple level, you know, we have the RTA is authorized by the state to uh, tax within its service area to support its operations. Uh, the state also levies a, a sales tax, as, as do counties um, and some, some home rule municipalities. So things we could do. We could adjust the existing sales tax rate within the RTA region. We could broaden the sales tax base to include new things, more on that in a second. Or there's a world where maybe there's a combination of the two that could uh, be worth thinking about and considering. Uh, next slide, please. But when, when we think about the sales tax, there are, are a couple of things that are really important to keep top of mind. One piece is that um, in this state, we uh, primarily uh, tax, maybe I need to stand back a little bit. We primarily are taxing goods and not services. And uh, this has been something that CMAP has been discussing for many years and other people who are frankly not even concerned with transit have been talking about for many years because it's a matter of modernizing the way that we uh, do taxes in the state. But as uh, our economy continues to evolve, people are spending a greater share of their income on services, less on goods. And as that changes, we're losing the opportunity to like tax these things that are an element of economic activity. So functionally, the sales tax is losing power over time. And that has implications for transit, but it also has implications for the other elements that um, are supported by the sales tax. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, you know, another piece that we have heard continuously through this process is uh, that we already have very high composite sales tax in this region. 
So, so what does that mean? Um, between all of the different kind of bodies that ha have the sales tax that show up on the receipt that consumer pays, uh, in Cook County, we have between nine and 11% sales tax. And throughout the collar counties, we have seven to 8.75% sales tax. And this makes us um, quite high among, uh, among states, uh, among our peer states, but certainly not highest in the nation. Uh, the city of Chicago, when it's all said and done, has almost the highest uh, sales tax of a, 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 major, a major city in the nation. So when we think about the sales tax, simply adding more on top of that, you know, is something that needs to be discussed in some detail. Next slide, please. So this is why we're talking about all right, we have the opportunity to raise the RTA sales tax rate within the RTA service area. That would be probably the most straight ahead thing to do. Um, simplest, if any of this can be characterized as simple, uh, but thinking about broadening the sales tax base to embrace new services um, potentially could allow us to uh, broaden the base, so bring in bring in more money, which would let the state potentially lower their rate, uh, and then the RTA rate could remain the same or possibly rise in um, balance to the way the state rate had been lowered, such that from the consumer perspective, um, sales taxes are either going uh, down or remaining the same. So this, you know, potentially potentially could be a good solution. Next slide. Um, we're working on uh, identifying individual services and forecasting the potential revenues from the different scenarios that we're testing, information that we're going to bring to you in detail um, to your staffs. So as I said, the uh, potential benefit of a hybrid approach could be uh, that we would reduce the composite sales tax rate for consu consumers. Um, typically, wealthier people spend more on services than lower income people do. So including more services into the sales tax base introduces more progressivity into the tax. Uh, it would raise new funds for transit, but also for all of the other entities that are um, supported by sales tax. And potentially with more money coming to the state, there could be an opportunity to talk about matching the sales tax at a, at a higher rate over time. Um, next slide, please. And so when we talk about services, what are we talking about? Um, like I said, we're hard at work with SB Friedman and, and working with our you know, advisory committees, thinking about what is a proposal that actually could make sense. From, from an equity and just like a good public policy standpoint, probably taxing housing, utilities, and healthcare is not where we want to go. Um, but there are, or there are opportunities for some pieces of transportation services, such as like if you take a limo ride. Um, recreation, like in this state, you don't pay sales tax on um, golf, which uh, most other states have, for instance. Uh, food service and accommodations, some financial services. It's um, The biggest one, though, that we're really looking at is software as a service. So an example would be that in the past, like maybe you all will relate to this, you would spend a lot of money to purchase software and it would come on a CD and you would install it on your computer and you would use it until something new came out and then you'd buy the new CD. That was subject to sales tax. Today, uh, you buy a subscription, you connect to these resources online, and that is not subject to sales tax. So, so it, there's an element of being modern and making sure that we're not missing things as the economy changes and moves. And so those are the kinds of things we're, we're looking at. And we're going to make an assessment down to detailed NAICS codes of what we think would be reasonable and should be considered by the state. Uh, next slide, please. In addition to this, we've been talking with your staffs about um, how different, uh, we could be more creative thinking about how different roadway funding sources could also support transit. All of these things are going to have um, written recommendations with context that will come and be, be available to be reviewed by everyone. But just to remind you, um, we're thinking about the role parking, uh, fee, uh, additional fee on commercial parking could play in uh, CBD or CBD like areas, not talking about your, you know, municipal parking on a side street, but, but commercial parking. Um, although the state recently raised the vehicle registration uh, fee 
That's another source that over the short term could potentially be looked at to raise re revenue. Similarly with the motor fuel tax, you know, is there an additional penny for transit or some kind of proposal that could make sense in the short term to meet our immediate needs? Um, uh, we're looking at all of the transportation funds that come into the state and whether there might be an opportunity to shift shift some money uh, around in terms of, of how it's spent in order to support the immediate needs of transit. Uh, and also to support what Daniel was talking about before, if we want to build the system that we want that will bring people back to transit, there are going to be costs associated with that. So how are we going to cover that? How are we going to cover moving to regional rail? How are we going to cover having world-class bus service? Like these are the things we're thinking about in this space. Along the same lines, uh, tolling is also being discussed. We're making estimates of what what would be raised by uh, introducing an increment onto the existing toll structure or by uh, implementing tolls on IDOT roads that are currently untold. You know, all of this is about trying to make a serious assessment of what the options are so that we can have a conversation about what makes sense. Uh, along the same lines, we are continuing to talk about the transition to road user charging in the region and what this could look like. Uh, I think there's a scenario where we have a short-term package and we have a long-term package that has the transition to road user charge with an element for transit in it. Um, and, uh, and, all, and also we've made an assessment of if Chicago were to implement a, a cordon uh, along the lines of what London has done or what New York has done, how much do we think that that would raise and what would be the impacts on uh, uh, vehicle movement? So we're looking at all these things and actually more things. And if any of you have any ideas for more things that you haven't heard us look at that you think we seriously should look at, please let us know. Uh, we're writing it all up right now uh, and converging kind of towards the summer, uh, trying to, to create some rank priority among these different options. Next slide, please. And I just wanna note that, you know, these things are not cleanly divided among one another. So when we talk about how we're going to pay for it, something we've been, you know, Daniel was talking about earlier is, okay, fares have to have a role in how we support transit. But in order to do that, we need to make sure that we're protecting vulnerable people and their needs. So we need to make a realistic assessment of what those costs and trade-offs are and make sure that we're understanding when we ask for the one thing, there are these other impacts. And similarly, we've been hearing throughout um, this process that um, for uh, for the region to have confidence in this level of investment. They want to see performance measures. They want to understand how financial stewardship is going to be insured. And so we're talking about the fare box recovery ratio. I think at this point, everyone is, is fairly in agreement that this is not the right performance measure for us now. So what is? I think that's a you know conversation that we're going to want to continue to have, and is also related to um, what Amy Lee is going to discuss with you here in a minute. So just trying to draw some of the interrelationships for you. Uh, next slide, please. So I know that's a lot, and people probably have strong opinions about these things. Um, you know, we would welcome one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations with anyone who wants to engage with us on any of these options, if that's easier. But if you have um, reflections that you want to share with the group now, we would appreciate that. And even and more specifically, since we believe the sales tax is going to be an important part of this package, what needs to be known, demonstrated, worked out, dealt with um, to advance the conversation on the sales tax? Commissioner? Oh, and then Jennifer. Sure. Um, could you talk a little bit about how these kinds of ideas compare to what other major cities are doing? You know, we know New York had a massive short-term bailout from their governor. Um, we know San Francisco has ridership much lower than ours by about 20%. So I'd be curious, um, you know, what is transferable in terms of ideas or have you had the chance to look into those things? Yeah, that's a great question. And we have, um, we've been looking at it. We've had conversations with the systems in some cases. I think uh, New York's solution, I'm looking Daniel to help me here, is, was a head tax, no, payroll tax. And they've just been working through that like in real time right now. And so we've been trying to watch what other, other places are doing, understanding that, that our context is not gonna be transferable necessarily to the New York or California system. But yeah, yeah, we're, we are 
if somebody comes up with an idea that is going to solve this for us, we would immediately love to copy it. But uh, it's not not yet. Executive. So just, I guess, a, a little bit of a question, a little bit of an observation. You know, some of these ideas for funding are solutions that are, are not in our control here. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know the, the will of the, um, the General Assembly. I mean, obviously, service tax has been talked about for years, and everyone's grabbing at the same dollars. I, I, I guess I'm trying to understand, too, how engaged this, um, this conversation and these ideas are in conjunction with the, the governor or... Um, leadership at, at the, in the General Assembly, because most of these ideas, I mean, we have no control over. So we're coming up with solutions that we can think are a great idea, but obviously a vote for a service tax increase is not going to be very uh, popular. So is there anything internally in regards to the solutions, um, even if they're minor ones, even if they're moving, you know, moving us a little notch that we, you know, CMAP or the RTA can control a little better? Oh, things we can control better. Because um, we can come up with the best plan. And again, there's going to have to be a vote somewhere. And for people who are elected, um, it's a different ballgame. Of course. And we deal with this all the time. Solutions that, you know, you have no, you know, there's no collateral damage for a lot of the people sitting at that this steering committee table, you know. Well, uh, I'll, I'll start by just saying that I think we're we're fortunate in that we're doing the report at the request of the legislature. So, you know, I think in one sense, we view our role as providing our best professional assessment of the situation and what the options are. Um, but, I, but we're also having a lot of conversations with a lot of people to try and understand what the dimensions of getting to yes could be. Uh, and I think this is more of a, an Aaron thing to comment on from this point. <laughs> Well, no, I just hope all of you aren't kicking me under the table here. I mean, again, the this we aren't under any false impression that these these are complicated issues that are going to require us to follow through on, right? It's not like we're just going to be able to hand this off to the General Assembly and they'll be like, oh, great, let me implement these things. Um, but they're going to need to have to see the support that comes along with it, which is, I think, one of the reasons why we curated the um, uh, stakeholders that are part of the working group that have broader reaches, the Illinois Retail Merchants Association, or many of our economic development partners, we're really trying to make sure that we're understanding from others beyond the transportation sector, the implications here. I will also share that there are places across the country that are having conversations about how they're spending their CMAC dollars or how they're spending their FTA dollars or how they're, or um, FHWA dollars and where they're flexing them. A lot of that has to do with capital investment, but capital investments could help support uh, the rebalancing of um, operational uh, investments. None of those are silver bullets unto themselves, but it's a conversation that this region could also have. And by this region, I mean this table and this body in terms of the policies and how we spend our transportation dollars today. So if you didn't like anything you said, or I, Elizabeth said, you know, perhaps you don't like anything I said either, but that, you know, I, I want to make sure that we're having an honest conversation because you did ask, what do we control? I want to, I know Frank wanted to weigh in and then um, Sarah Kwasniewski. Yes, I, I just had a comment and a question. The, the comment is that the comment is that the, the fiscal cliff is real and big and major and we need to address it and it's not going to be easy. Uh, in terms of the options laid out here, I have a personal bias against the sales tax increase. Uh, I understand about the services adding that, but that's has been commented on that it's been discussed for 20 years or more without much progress. My bias is that we ought to be doing more of the parking fee, the vehicle registration, motor fuel tax, reallocating state road funds and tolling as possibilities because it's less regressive than the sales tax. The sales tax is a very regressive tax. Uh, and second, you get the connection between road funds and drivers and licenses and so on who are beneficiaries of better transit. So I think we ought to be focusing as much as possible on uh, taxes 
uh, that address automobile traffic in one way or another, and there are multiple taxes. That's the comment. The question I have is that any business or household that faces a fiscal cliff starts looking at their expenses. Are you looking at cost savings? Uh, the RTA does a great job benchmarking our service boards in comparison to national peers. And when we've looked at this, we've really seen that they're pretty efficient. Um, that is not to say that uh, there shouldn't be a conversation about good financial stewardship and that that has to be part of selling this to people because you can't just say, I'm, I'm, trust me, I'm efficient. Like we, we have to make that case and tell that story certainly and continue to be uh, creative and thoughtful about how, what efficiency could look like in the future. You know, are we always trying to push towards doing the best with what we have? And I think that comes down really to the conversation about performance measures that I was alluding to before. Uh, you know, if financial stewardship of the transit system is important to the region, what is the appropriate way to think about that and evaluate it in comparison to our goals? Well, you're right. You're right about. I mean, going to the public and saying we need more money, give us, we'll raise your taxes. Not going to work. Yeah. Well, have you done anything to address costs? If the answer is no, it's perfect. Then that's a tougher sell. Chair Kwasniewski. Yeah, just a couple things. One, uh, just on, on, on Aaron's comment about potentially shifting some of those capital dollars to helping us with our operations. I think that's kind of, I, I don't I don't see how, even given the, even give transit agencies the option of doing that, I don't see how that works when we're all trying to get to zero emissions and there's monumental cost, infrastructure costs in regards to that. That's just, just a side comment. My other comment is, have, have you guys reached out or looked at um, or contacted APTA? I mean, obviously, uh, uh, Dorval is the president of APTA. And across the country, there have been referendums specifically for, and I know you guys had looked at this before, uh, Aaron, specifically for uh, public transit. And whatever they're calling it, uh, they've been, there's been a number of successful, a lot of successful referendums. There's been some failed ones, but I think it, the successful ones far outweigh it. And I think it's a matter of coming up and saying, listen, you all say you want additional services. Um, and, you know, unfortunately we're having this conversation when we're talking about the financial cliff of what happened with COVID. So, does that help or hurt the situation? I don't know. But I, I guess my, my comment is, you know, have, have your consultants looked at the successes of some of those referendums across the country of which I just pulled it up right now. And depending on the year, there's quite a few. So what are they doing in convincing people that transit is worth more than we're not doing? Or just we haven't tried? Well, I think you bring up a good point. I don't know to what extent the team has looked at referendums. Um, I think not in a in a super focused way, but we're generally aware of it. I guess my my one reaction is that those referenda often are supporting new like new rail or big new things that people can see and touch. And I think our situation is is a little bit different, but your comments make me think, well, it wouldn't necessarily have to be if you framed it around the energy transition or, you know, mo modernization or the future or so something like that. So that's a, that's a good thought and something we'll think about more. Yeah, it just, I mean, obviously we're talking about not just balancing ourselves because of COVID, we're looking at the future of whatever transit agencies or transit we want in the region. So we are looking at those things that are mm -hmm. larger projects that need to get done, whether they're with CTA or Metro or with us. So, you know, I think when we're looking at that, we've got to be looking across the country. And I know there's been some comparables that the consultants have done that relate to some of the benchmarks and so forth. But, you know, what about the success of those referendums? They're happening across the country. Yeah, and I think historically this region hasn't had a whole lot of referendums, but we have had a successful example in the Cook County Forest Preserves re referendum that happened recently. Um, 
you know, and that's to invest in the existing infrastructure of the, the forest preserve. So I think it, it's, it's worthy of consideration. All, All right. right, well, please let us know. You can uh, let, let Aaron know if you'd like to have a conversation with our team or your staffs to, to talk with us. We probably are already talking to them, but, but any, any type of focused conversation that would be helpful here, we get that this is extremely challenging and appreciate your, your engagement as we have a conversation about what's possible. So th thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, your patience. This is effectively three presentations in one. Um, I'm here to give you a recap of the discussions that we've been having within the How to Implement It group. This is also known as the governance group. Um, you'll see here we're not nearly as far along as the other two discussion groups um, because we've been waiting to hear what is it that we're supposed to implement and how are we going to fund that. So um, just a brief recap of the discussions we've had to date. Uh, we started uh, by establishing what are seen as problem issues that either challenge how our transit serves the region um, as we want it in the future, uh, or are viewed as impediments to securing additional funding. This is largely based off of feedback that we've had uh, through interviews, uh, interviews and stakeholder uh, engagement uh, uh, that, that um, started at the, the start of this part process. Fundamentally, the underlying problem that was cited is a disconnect around how decisions are made by various players in the transit space. Um, we then took a look at case studies. We, we were asked, how do other regions do this? Um, and when we examined how other regions govern transit, um, we learned that history and context are, are really intrinsic to how each region uh, makes those decisions. That is. Another region's model uh, may not be applicable uh, in its entirety to us, but there could be elements there that uh, do make sense and help us to move forward in our discussion. Um, and so that has kind of laid the groundwork for how we're gonna have this very easy and straightforward conversation around governance. Um, that's sarcasm. So I think I can, I can tell everyone's tired here. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so to help you see how we're trying to approach this discussion, we are looking at the array of functions that comprise the overall transit system. Within the system, there are functions that relate to service, to funding, for policy, and so on. And then within each of these functions, next slide, please, we want to explore the, val the value of the degree of centralization uh, that centralization might play in transit's ability to deliver on the system that we want, uh, and so that we can better understand um, uh, how centralization plays into demonstrating good stewardship um, as we make an appeal for additional new funding. Next slide, please. When we put these things together, this is just to illustrate, for example, we can see across uh, a variety of functions that live within the transit system that depending on the function, we could foreseeably have a different approach to where we sit on the spectrum of centralization and decentralization. Certainly that is true for where we are today as a region. And we certainly saw this um, in case studies for uh, other regions as they looked to govern transit suited to their needs. Um, next slide, please. Uh, as we continue to tease out feedback from the part steering committee about which functions stand to gain from greater centralization and which functions make sense where they are today, um, we CMAP staff, we recognize that reform for the sake of reform can lead to unintended consequences. That's not what we're trying to do here. Um, and so we recognize that we need to make a case for reform. To that end, um, we are being mindful of how the recommended reforms tie to problem issues that we identified early on, as well as the recommendations that are coming out of the system we want group and how to pay for a group. Um, as we consider the benefits, we need to hear from you really, um, the trade-offs and anticipate what mitigations might be needed should we think about advancing 
uh, governance reform recommendations. Next slide, please. So in our most recent discussion with the governance group, we spoke of a spectrum of options that provide a general idea of the level of structural reform that could be pursued. Um, at the top, well, with being uh, the most decentralized, you can see the first option uh, was to minimize the role of RTA. Let's take out um, its oversight and other functions and just have those dollars flow directly to the service boards. Next was status quo. Um, you can see both have been grayed out. Neither of these options we felt uh, would help us address the problem issues um, and uh, really help us achieve the system that we want. Um, the remaining options include keeping the structure as it is today, but consider a different way of allocating funding. As many of you know, most of transit operation dollars are allocated by statutory formula. After that, there's the option of keeping the current structure by strengthening the RTA. This could, just to go back to uh, some of the examples we showed before, this could be a potential uh, strengthening of the RTA on certain functions, um, but again, keeping the same structure. And finally, the most centralized option is a full integration of all agencies into a single regional entity reporting to a single board of directors. Um, in the coming weeks, the discussion group will be adding more uh, bo uh, flesh to the bones here around, around these last three options um, to better understand the potential benefits and trade-offs uh, there may be with these three options. Um, so with that, we'd like to hear some feedback. Um, the next slide is uh, our discussion slide, but it might actually be helpful to go back to the previous slide. If we could, yeah, thank you. I'd, I'd like to get some feedback from you all. If this is where we're going uh, in terms of the different models that we'll be further teasing out, uh, bringing uh, more recommendations around different uh, variations of these models, what are some of the things we should be thinking about? What are some of the benefits or trade-offs that you see associated with any one of these three? Chair Kwasniewski. <laughs> it's, it's kind of self-serving, I guess, but I'm just going to just talk a little bit in general. But no, I think, I mean, obviously it, it, it's good to look at all these different options because quite frankly, I think you alluded to the fact that different regions have different structures, um, in some cases, a lot more governance than we've got, and in, in some cases, less governance, depending on the, on the size of the operation. So, um, you know, the only thing I would say, if you're using, if you're using some comparables, use comparables that are similar to the Chicagoland region, um, you know, and, and LA is just one of them where, you know, there's probably a dozen different transit agencies that encompass the area. Um, New York's obviously different than that. So, I mean, you know, and, you know, maybe Dallas or some of the other ones that they, I think you would use as, a, as some comparables. I thought I seen something where there were some smaller uh, areas that you guys were referring to in some of your report, but maybe I'm mistaken. Um, just just to one, say one thing too is you know and 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 you know I think we collectively as the transit agencies have been doing a lot more collaboratively in the last five years or more um, that I remember more than ever. I mean we're we're talking about you know coordinating on services both with us and the CTA. We're talking about connectivity with. Um, both CTA, Metra, and PACE. Um, you know, we, we talk about uh, combined uh, purchases depending on what it is. Um, so, you know, in, in some cases, in, in even obviously, you know, we've, we've worked fairly closely with, with the Ventra system, even though it's not totally complete. So I think we're always looking at, at those different options out there, and we're going to continue to do that no matter what kind of structure there is. My only concern is, I think when you look at things as an overall super agency, if you want to call it that, is the devil's in the details in regards to those appointments. And it comes down to appointment, governance appointments and control and control of funding. 
and that looks at the entire region. So, um, and yeah, we, I, I think there are some challenges with the current system, depending on how people look at it, like who has more control than others. Um, so maybe some of that does need to be adjusted and fixed, but I think we need to look at things objectively before we make an arbitrary decision that we think, you know, a super agency is worth, is, is worth going into because there's complexities with that. Strengthening the RTA, I don't know what that means, but certainly, you know, I think we're, we're compliant with a lot of things that the, that the RTA requires of us and we would continue to be no matter what those structures would be. Amy, if I could, maybe it makes sense too, just in, in response to some of your comments, the, the way that we're, so we've got a spectrum of options for potential governance structures, but I think we're really trying to build that off one slide back or maybe two slides back. Oh, this is the one of really thinking about where the functions of the agencies, all, all three service boards plus RTA should belong, right? So, you know, is service planning uh, should it be done independently or should it be done by it should it be done in a more regionally coordinated way or fair policy? How are we setting our fair policy? And if we shift to more of a regional fair policy um, where you can tap on, tap off and, you know, we work out what agency gets the split of the fares at the back end, like we've seen some other places across the, the country work, you know, is that a, a responsibility of an RTA, right? And how would that work? So, you know, as opposed to just picking a model and plopping it down and saying that works for us or we, we aspire to be this, it's really what are the functions of each of your agencies and how best could they be coordinated to meet that desired future state that we've expressed that we want, you know, better than 2019, but really responsive to the dynamic ways people are moving and might be moving in a continued fashion into the future. Oh, yeah. Just, and I'm going to admit here, I'm probably the least experienced in this in this space here. Um, this is not my background, but I'm, again, I, I'm hearing things for the first time. So sometimes you come in with kind of a, a simple perspective. And, you know, I use the word internally. How in-depth are we having in conversation with RTA, CTA, and CASE? I know we, they were able to present, but again, um, you are charged with a task um, to change another entity, which is not an easy you know, or to review or to analyze, I guess, what you were doing. Um, another entity, how in depth are they in here? Have they offered suggestions for improvement themselves? Yes, I think in short, yes. So we're, we're in contact with RTA, CTA, and the, well, all the service boards on a pretty regular basis at different levels of the organization. Um, and so, you know, a lot of the work that we have again, sort of elevated for your understanding is a lot of the good work that the service boards are already undertaking um, in the system that we want. Um, we want to make sure we're developing recommendations that are actually achievable, right? We're not trying to achieve pie in the sky things. We're actually working pretty closely with the service boards to make sure that, you know, if we're going to put out there and, and say we're going to add value in these ways, are these things that you can actually um, deliver on. And so a lot of the things that you see, they are trying to work on behind the scenes. But time and time again, what we see is um, it's a shortfall in funding that is often bringing us back to that um, inability to deliver in the way that, that a lot of folks would like to see. And so I guess that's my follow-up question. If that's the answer, are, are they internally looking at ways they, they cut their own costs? I mean, that's... I, that's that's kind of the the own question. Again, I, the goals are great. I think they're wonderful. I think we all agree with the goals, but it always has to start internally. And I, I guess it'd be a nice um, a nice opportunity just to to look at where they think. I mean, I guess if I'm hearing pace say yes, let's go to a regional, uh, you know, a regional approach or you know a one single entity. It, it it's a little different than us all here recommending that to them because it's easy for us I didn't to. Say that I, you did not say that. You did not. But I, I guess I, I I value the experts, and that's that's what I'm I'm trying to say here. I, I really value the expertise of these people in there. We know that we have to have a solution. You can't keep going the same. You can't keep um, continuing this path. So 
let's put more responsibility on the experts in there and saying we have to do this. So get here and come up with some real changes. Yeah. Thank you. I know no. that's not a new idea, but I know, no, just... but it's, it's a very good, like common sense question to be asking. And I think that those questions, you know, to, um, in previous meetings of the transportation committee, um, as well as directly with the part steering committee, the service boards have been very upfront about discussing some of the, um, efficiency strategies that have been implemented. Um, they recognize that costs are going to continue to grow with inflation and things like that outside of their control. Um, but I think that the gap that we're talking about is sizable enough that what we really are talking about is service cuts at the end of the day. There's not a whole lot else um, that will really uh, meaningfully bridge that that gap. I, I, but I just want to say, I, I think efficiencies can always happen, and I think we continue to do that. And, you know, we're certainly open to opportunities that we actually work together. And, you know, we could be not thinking about something today, and in, in a year, all of a sudden, we're working with one of the other transit agencies on some kind of an endeavor that's going to save all of us money. So we'll we'll continue to do that, and I think that should be something that should be part of everybody's goal. Agree. That's best coming directly from you all. Um, and I and I think to that extent, I think um, you know governance plays a role in helping to tell that story with transparency and and accountability. And so those are some of the things that we want to further explore. Frank, I saw you grab the microphone, and then Jim. Yeah, um, we have three three service boards who perform extraordinarily well when you compare them to. Uh, uh, national averages in terms of performance or efficiency and so on, well run, well managed, so on. So the real question is not what are you doing now, but the question ought to be for, for Rich and Mike and Jim, the governor calls you up and says, I want you to be chairman of the board of the RTA, or I want you to be CEO of the RTA. Would you do that for me and be responsible for transit for metropolitan Chicago? What changes would you like to see? What would you say to the governor and say, I'll take that job if, or would you say, okay, thanks? I, I, I think we'd really have to have some thought into it, but I mean, Frank makes a very good point because I think no matter what the sell job is on, on whatever we try to end up raising these funds and coordinating between the agencies, it's gonna be a matter of what plans do we have individually and then together as a region for these improvements, because I don't think it's gonna come just basically saying, hey, by the way, yeah, we're gonna reform and we're gonna build this one agency, but we're gonna add some more funding to it and we're gonna give you a carte blanche. So, you know, I think all of us have that challenge. I mean, we've got some, you know, unique things that we're trying to do th throughout the throughout the collar counties with on-demand service and and uh, you know, working with TNCs and a lot of different other things, but you know, I think collectively, I mean, it would be, it, it would be a collective endeavor, and I think the RTA's probably got a better handle on all of our projects on what priorities would be. But that would be that would be a challenge, Frank. If if and I, don't, I wouldn't think that would happen, but <laughs> that'd be a tough one. Maybe maybe Omer would. <laughs> <laughs> so no, but I, I I think that's a point in case. It's like, okay, who would do that? And or what would that what would the complexity of, of that type of board look like? I mean, and then how does that sit with the governance aspect of those appointees where, you know, governor appointee and city appointees and counties and so forth? I mean, it's pretty complex. It's a it's complex as it is, I think. I know. Jim wanted something in us. We've got Mayor Shulky and uh, okay. Oh, uh, Jill, sorry. Did you? Oh, Jim. Yeah, I'll take that job if. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is what it boils down to. What I've been saying, it's it's the funding. The funding has to be put in place, and it has to be built in a way that it doesn't deteriorate. In 08, the funding that was put in place, which was thought to be a solution, deteriorated, and that's why we had the fiscal cliff that we're not hitting now. This is COVID related. But in 2019, every single one of us is making adjustments because it wasn't sustainable. You, know, you take the job if it can be readdressed and, and looked at 
on a continual basis to make sure that the system that you want is the system that you can provide. Here's my resume. Then I agree with, uh, um, we don't need a super board. That, that the, the gover uh, changing governance doesn't change the, the fundamental problem. The fundamental problem is funding. Mayor, did you, or did you have something? Yeah, I just wanted to throw out, uh, I think the wild card in the room here is the physical disparities that are found in our region. And uh, for some other stuff I've been involved with, and some of you know a little bit about it, I've had the opportunity, I have visited every neighborhood in the entire region. I have been in every town, every neighborhood, uh, seen it all. And I will tell you that if you go and look at it, there is why there's neighborhoods where there's maybe three houses out of 20 are occupied. There's businesses are closed. Uh, conditions are run down. There's other places that are, you know, just beautiful and full of stuff. And, you know, I don't know. I think there's some people that would want to try to recalculate or reorganize boards into something that you're going to give maybe some other folks a better ch shot at stuff. I don't know where that all goes. I, I like the idea that you say that a super board isn't gonna work. Cause I, I think the super board probably wouldn't work. And the one the good thing that's going on here now is that with the three boards that are there, there's at least somebody sitting on those boards from every one of the counties or the regions. And like in Cook County, there's five sub regions or whatever it is. So at least there's a voice and eyes there. And you, you really have an idea then of, you know, what's going on and everybody's hopefully in the room is speaking for the room because I, I could see you creating something super and suddenly there wouldn't be anybody there representing one of these areas because this disparity of, of success versus failure or however you want to describe it is, is very, very widespread in the region and we have it much more so than I think most people realize. This Thank you. Just a, a quick comment as you're looking at one of the options, you know, stronger regional coordinating agency, but keeping the service boards and having this slide up, you know, what analysis CMAP is doing that obviously everything can't slide over. We've heard about governance and some of the challenges with that. But if there were further pursuit of that option, which one or two of those green lines starts to move toward the other? Because I mean, I think how that looks, it's it's the ripple effect of domino. So I think as we flush out this conversation more, what would be, you know, back to Frank's earlier question, you know, if you took the job, what would you do? What would be the top two, two things? Yeah, thank you. So we did um, send a survey kind of along these lines to the part steering committee. We want to really gauge and understanding, have a meaningful discussion, right, around the things that they want to have achieved. And what does that mean for each of these functions? We often get to this um, whenever we talk about money and power, <laughs> it gets to be a very complicated discussion. And so what we want to do is make sure we're being thoughtful when we talk about a mega agency or a strengthened regional entity, what needs to be strengthened to achieve um, the system we want. Okay, so I actually just have one quick slide after this. Um, and then I'll, I'll keep it brief. So just so you know, recognizing some of the comments that were made up before, we recognize that this is a monumental task and it's not really just on CMAP, it is on uh, the region as a whole. And so a lot of the recommendations really do need to dial into what do transit riders want? What do taxpayers want? Um, RTA has launched a very expansive effort to get feedback from the the public on these things. What we've done recently is we've uh, convened some targeted focus groups just to dial in a little bit more. Um, you could see up here on the screen the focus groups that have already been conducted and then um, three remaining uh, focus groups that we'll be conducting over the summer to really help us paint the full picture of the impacts of transit in our region. Some quick takeaways um, that we've heard so far, public transit is an essential public service. It's recognized it's not a business. Um, and so this is pretty critical for the for government to really step in. The other is that, um, you know, the theme here is we can't, the, the um, funding mechanisms that we saw earlier uh, are, are a heavy lift, but we also can't afford to let transit fail. 
Um, transit plays an essential role to support tourism, um, our workforce, congestion reduction, air quality uh, concerns, as well as uh, supporting an interdependent regional economy. Um, and another thing that we've heard too is that uh, regional transit really needs to um, move more towards regional, um, a recognition that perhaps um, maybe some of the, the, dis, the, the fragmented decision-making here really challenges our ability to be agile and to um, be responsive to the changing travel markets that we're seeing today. Um, with that, I, I don't know if we have any more to cover. No, I, I think the next slide, it just shows that uh, we are working on white papers on all of these issues that we discussed with you today. We will be delivering some video presentations that we'll make publicly available and send to you all. I'm working on getting out to all of the county boards um, as well to discuss with them about priorities and policies. But um, if there are things that you specifically would want to talk with us about, we are getting lots of things on the calendar. So let us know if we can come talk to you about this in more depth. Um, Okay, Mike. I'm just going to go back to um, the, the concern about the governance structure, and, and it, several points of view have been aired here. Um, I, I'm very familiar with what they're doing in New York, uh, and I have good friends that work there. One of the friends of mine who's a peer of mine runs one of the bus, one of the 35 bus garages for New York's transit, um, and he recently got a new bus garage. But in New York, all of the capital construction is run by the big agency at the top. And so he had no say in that garage at all. Uh, and at the end of the construction period, he got a box of keys and he and his staff moved into a bus garage with their buses. Um, but, but they had no say or no concern. And, and so there are unintended consequences of whatever type of structure you wanna put into place. Is, is that good? I, I, you know, I, I'm not in a position to judge whether it's better to go on the New York model so that all of their capital construction projects are run by the New York's MTA capital construction division, not by the bus division. But this was a this is a bus garage that's in Queens. Um, and, and there are certainly local needs in Queens, but the bus garage was cookie cutter built by the capital construction group and then turned over to the operating group to actually operate out of that garage. And he said he's going to be adjusting for the next five years to figure out how to live within this bus garage and change his organizational structure or his operating division because of what the capital construction division, the, the overarching built for him and turned over to him with a box full of keys. So again, unintended consequences, we have to be aware of those. And, and as has been pointed out a couple of times, it's important for us to look at what our peers are doing and what works for them and what doesn't work for them. What are the good things that come out of that and what are the bad things? And, and I, I appreciate the, the eyes open approach that the CMAP staff have been taking to this because they've been asking all of us. They've been, as mentioned, they've been in contact with our staff and, and, and the folks at PACE and, and the folks at Metra as well and the folks at RTA and talking through these. So what would you do if that was there? What, how, would you, how would you deal with that? How would those decisions be made what would be better? What would be worse? And some of that, some of that discussion has been going on among that group with with the help of CMAP. So it's a it's a it's an interesting process to watch, and it's an interesting process to be a part of. Uh, I've enjoyed the, the the contact and the discussions, but as has also been said, all of us already talk to each other. We have regular periodic meetings with Pace and with the Metro folks and not only on the on the venture system, but on the way the service is structured and how we can have efficiencies between us. Uh, it's it's all been a part of what we've been doing. Uh, again, uh, the the process has put a microscope on all of that as well. Uh, and that microscope is not going away, as, as you've hinted at. Uh, this is just going to get a, a sharper focus over the next couple of months here with the white papers coming out. Uh, and then ultimately, this group in September and again in October with uh, with the joint meeting, so thanks. thanks. Thanks for the example, Mike. No, uh, thank you, thank you, everyone. I think uh, CMAP, uh, all three presenter, you guys did a terrific job highlighting uh, all aspects of this critical issue. This we got our work cut out for us. Period. 
Um, and I'm, I'm glad we had this healthy discussion, very informative uh, for me at a personal level because I haven't been exposed to this uh, uh, volume of information um, until today. And, and, and I know my staff has been briefing me, but this is, this is our core mission. If there is one issue that is overriding for us, it's gotta be this issue. So I appreciate the healthy discussion. And with that, uh, I would like to move on to uh, item 6.02. And that's Mr. John Carpenter with the legislative update. Good morning. Um, as you all are aware, the, the General Assembly adjourned at about three in the morning on Saturday of uh, Memorial Day weekend upon the passage of the $50 billion budget, which was signed by the governor yesterday. There were a few transit and transportation related bills that I'd like to give you an update on. Uh, first is House Bill 1342, is uh, the omnibus transit bill that Daniel mentioned earlier. This makes a number of uh, transit-related changes. It allows service boards, the services board, the service boards to confiscate fare media and suspend riding privileges for riders that threaten safety or commit public indecency. It requires service boards to only enter into contracts for bus purchases for zero emission buses starting in 2026. It enables a two-year extension uh, of the fare box recovery ratio requirement waiver. It requires the service boards to report on a number of performance metrics, including staffing levels, um, scheduled and delivered services, and safety on the system, including the number of incidents of crime. The bill also requires the RTA to study the feasibility of providing year-round free and reduced fares and creating a more equitable fare system. Another bill, House Bill 2068 passed both houses on its way to the governor. The bill requires certain employers to provide pre-tax transit benefits to their employees. And another bill, which Aaron mentioned earlier today that uh, you're, I'm sure you're familiar with, House Bill 2878, it's the Pro Procurement Omnibus Bill. Uh, this bill was filed in the Senate as an amendment to a House bill. Uh, the amendment included a number of changes to the Public-Private Partnership for Transportation Act including removing the reference to MPOs in the statute and language that requires uh, 3P projects to be compliant with the regional plan. While the state can't change what MPOs are federally required to do as part of the regional transportation planning process, we prefer this language remain in the bill to be retained in the statute. Uh, we express this concern, concern on this provision to the House sponsor, um, Majority Leader Jay Hoffman, um, who was surprised that it was in conflict with federal law. He understands our objections and he has committed to us and he committed to us at the committee hearing uh, to address our concerns at the upcoming, during the upcoming veto session with a trailer bill. Uh, we're in the process of preparing a much longer summary and analysis of legislation enacted by uh, the recent general assembly session. And we will provide that to you when it's complete. If you have any questions, we're happy to answer them. Any legislative questions for John? Pardon me? I said any legislative oh. questions from the body for John? No. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Then with that, um, down to the public uh, public comment. Do we have any comments from the public who are here physically today? Any comment from the public? Seeing none, thank you. I have one. Uh, I'm on Zoom. I'm not sure if I can be heard. It, look, it looks like we have two uh, hands raised for virtual public oh. comments. So yes, please. Okay. When we go ahead with, uh, I see Garland Armstrong, and then I see Jack Jordan. So we'll go in that order. Garland. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. How you doing? This Garland Armstrong, formerly of the Plains, now living in Des Moines. I just want to comment, especially when y'all talking about the fiscal cliff coming up in 2026, my biggest concern is I hope the federal, I hope you take this to the federal lawmakers and see them everything from top to bottom, what's gonna be happening, as Aaron said in 2026, gonna be sombering because they need to make sure to collaborate not only with the three agencies, but also with the disability community. So how we can all be well prepared for the fiscal cliff coming in 2026, because I think the time is right now that 
all together, federal, state, local, municipalities, everybody get all on the bandwagon because this fiscal cliff for y'all is going to be a big disaster, not only for the Chicagoland area, but maybe for the possibly for the state what's going to be happening if there's no public transit in the state. And, I, and like what Aaron says in some other cities too, they're also going to have the same similar thing. So I think that everybody, not only in the state of Illinois, but also in the Chicagoland area with the federal, state, city, local and stakeholders, all of them should get together and collaborate on this one because this is a must for y'all to be well prepared for it. So that's my suggestion for it. And also just want to give y'all a heads up. Five more days coming. Me and my wife is coming back to the Chicagoland area. It's been two years since we left the Chicagoland area, May of 2021. But this coming Tuesday, we're coming back as vacation visitors. And then we'll be able to be over at different board meetings. The only problem is with Pace and Metra, both of them are going to have both the same board meetings before we leave. It's a scheduling conflict. So I wish, wish Metra would have a different date so we could see them in person. Because it's gonna be, it's gonna be so emotional, bittersweet to see everybody there. So, I just want y'all to know what is what coming up on June thirteenth. We'll be leaving and we'll be coming back to the Chicagoland area. And I'll be glad to answer any questions or comments from any of y'all. Thanks, Garland. I know the folks in the room are looking forward to seeing you. All right. So, um, Jack Jordan. Hi, everyone. Thanks for the presentation today. Um, I'm Jack Jordan. I'm a transit user. Uh, I take the UP West from Geneva into the city for work, and I also live part-time up at Evanston and take the UP North, as well as other, you know, various buses and trains in the city. And I just wanted to just highlight for everyone in the room, uh, I thought that just the, the small conversation that was had around a referendum was uh, really caught my attention, because I think what we're talking about today is that we really need nothing short of a uh, kind of a revolution in the way that our transit system works, especially as it addresses uh, the inequitable distribution of, of efficient transit, as well as its impact on climate, uh, climate mitigation and adaptation. And I think that's, we need a revolution from the, from the system side of transit, but, but really even more so in the conceptualization that people have of transit and the myriad of benefits it has into fighting both of those things. And I think a referendum, um, would really kind of be able to carve out somewhat of a social contract between government and people that says like, look, we're, we as people, we're agreeing to, you know, fund transit through, you know, X, Y, and Z mechanisms that are, that are figured out by this group. And the government saying that we will prioritize, you know, uh, transit in areas that have been disadvantaged, transit that supports climate. And I really think that something on the scale of a referendum is, is almost what is needed to get people who don't think about this on a daily basis, people that take their cars to work every day and, and haven't taken public transit in 15, 20 years to think about all the benefits it has in that capacity. So uh, I just think there's a lot of those intangibles of getting people bought into the transit system in the long term that could be addressed through such a referendum in the, in the next you know, few, five, 10 years. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else for public comment online? Hearing none, I'll turn it back over to our chair. Thank you. And with that, um, I think it's been mentioned before, as a reminder, we will have a special meeting scheduled with the CMAP board on Wednesday, September 13th. It will be on the second floor of this building right here. Um, the last item, can I get a motion to adjourn? Oh, Thank you. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Oh, for say nay. Watching carries. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. This was good.